Section 11 of Coningsby by Benjamin Disraeli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 3, Chapter 3. And you walked here, said Lady Everingham to Coningsby, when the stir of arranging themselves at dinner had subsided. Only think, papa, Mr. Coningsby walked here. I also am a great walker. I had heard much of the forest, said Coningsby. Which I am sure did not disappoint you, said the Duke. But forests without adventures, said Lady Everingham, a little shrugging her pretty shoulders. But I had an adventure, said Coningsby. Oh, tell it us by all means, said the lady, with great animation. Adventures are my weakness. I have had more adventures than any one. Have I not had Augustus, she added, addressing her husband. But you make everything out to be an adventure, Isabel, said Lord Everingham. I dare say that Mr. Coningsby was more substantial. And looking at our young friend, he invited him to inform them. I met a most extraordinary man, said Coningsby. It should have been a heroine, exclaimed Lady Everingham. Do you know anybody in this neighbourhood who rides the finest Arab in the world? asked Coningsby. She is called the Daughter of the Star, and was given to her rider by the Pasha of Egypt. This really is an adventure, said Lady Everingham, interested. The Daughter of the Star, said Lady Theresa. What a pretty name! Percy has a horse called Sunbeam. A fine Arab, the finest in the world, said the Duke, who was fond of horse. Who can it be? Can you throw any light on this, Mr. Lyle? asked the Duchess of a young man who sat next her. He was a neighbour who had joined their dinner party, Eustace Lyle, a Roman Catholic and the richest commoner in the country, for he had succeeded to a great estate early in his minority, which had only this year terminated. I certainly do not know the horse, said Mr. Lyle, but if Mr. Coningsby would describe the rider, perhaps? He is a man something under thirty, said Coningsby, pale with dark hair. We met in a sort of forest inn during a storm, a most singular man. Indeed, I never met any one who seemed to be so clever or to say such remarkable things. He must have been the spirit of the storm, said Lady Everingham. Charles Verney has a great deal of dark hair, said Lady Theresa, but then he is anything but pale, and his eyes are blue. And certainly he keeps his wonderful things for your ear, Theresa, said her sister. I wish that Mr. Coningsby would tell us some of the wonderful things he said, said the Duchess, smiling. Take a glass of wine first with my mother, Coningsby, said Henry Sidney, who had just finished helping them all to fish. Coningsby had too much tact to be entrapped into a long story. He already regretted that he had been betrayed into any allusion to the stranger. He had a wild, fanciful notion that their meeting ought to have been preserved as a sacred secret. But he had been impelled to refer to it in the first instance by the chance observation of Lady Everingham, and he had pursued his remark from the hope that the conversation might have led to the discovery of the unknown. When he found that his inquiry in this respect was unsuccessful, he was willing to turn the conversation. In reply to the Duchess, then, he generally described the talk of the stranger as full of lively anecdote and epigrammatic views of life, and gave them, for example, a saying of an old illustrious foreign prince, which was quite new and pointed, and which Coningsby told well. This led to a new train of discourse. The Duke also knew this illustrious foreign prince, and told another story of him, and Lord Everingham had played whist with this illustrious foreign prince often at the Travellers, and this led to a third story, none of them too long. Then Lady Everingham came in again, and sparkled agreeably. She, indeed, sustained throughout dinner the principal weight of the conversation, but as she asked questions of everybody, all seemed to contribute. Even the voice of Mr. Lyle, who was rather bashful, was occasionally heard in reply. Coningsby, who had at first unintentionally taken a more leading part than he aspired to, would have retired into the background for the rest of the dinner, but Lady Everingham continually signalled him out for her questions, and, as she sat opposite to him, he seemed the person to whom they were principally addressed. At length the ladies rose to retire. 
a very great personage in a foreign country but not remote country once mentioned to the writer of these pages that he ascribed the superiority of the english in political life in their conduct of public business and practical views of affairs in a great measure to that little half hour that separates after dinner the dark from the fair sex the writer humbly submitted that if the period of disjunction were strictly limited to a little half hour its salutary consequences for both sexes need not be disputed but that in england the little half hour was too apt to swell into a term of far more awful character and duration lady everingham was the disciple of the very little half-hour school for as she gaily followed her mother she said to coningsby whose gracious lot it was to usher them from the apartment pray do not be too long at the board of guardians to-day these were prophetic words for no sooner were they all again seated than the duke filling his glass and pushing the claret to coningsby observed i suppose lord monmouth does not trouble himself much about the new poor law hardly said coningsby my grandfather's frequent absence from england which his health i believe renders quite necessary deprives him of the advantage of personal observation on a subject than which i can myself conceive none more deeply interesting i am glad to hear you say so said the duke and it does you great credit and henry too whose attention i observed is directed very much to these subjects in my time the young men did not think so much of such things and we suffer consequently by the by everingham you who are a chairman of a board of guardians can give me some information supposing a case of outdoor relief i could not suppose anything so absurd said the son-in-law well rejoined the duke i know your views on that subject and it certainly is a question on which there is a good deal to be said but would you under any circumstances give relief out of the union even if the parish were to save a considerable sum i wish i knew the union where such a system was followed said lord everingham and his grace seemed to tremble under his son-in-law's glance the duke had a good heart and not a bad head if he had not made in his youth so many latin and english verses he might have acquired considerable information for he had a natural love of letters though his pack were the pride of england his barrel seldom missed and his fortune on the turf where he never betted was a proverb he was good and he wished to do good but his views were confused from want of knowledge and his conduct often inconsistent because the sense of duty made him immediately active and he often acquired in the consequent experience a conviction exactly contrary to that which had prompted his activity his grace had been a great patron and a zealous administrator of the new poor law he had been persuaded that it would elevate the condition of the labouring class his son-in-law lord everingham who was a whig and a clear-headed cold-blooded man looked upon the new poor law as another magna carta lord everingham was completely master of the subject he was himself the chairman of one of the most considerable unions of the kingdom the duke if he ever had a misgiving had no chance in argument with his son-in-law lord everingham overwhelmed him with quotations from commissioners rules and sub-commissioners reports statistical tables and references to dietaries sometimes with a strong case the duke struggled to make a fight but lord everingham when he was at fault for a reply which was very rare upbraided his father-in-law with the abuses of the old system and frightened him with visions of rates exceeding rentals of late however a considerable change had taken place in the duke's feeling on this great question his son henry entertained strong opinions upon it and had combated his father with all the fervour of a young votary a victory over his grace indeed was not very difficult his natural impulse would have enlisted him on the side if not of opposition to the new system at least of critical suspicion of its spirit and provisions it was only the statistics and sharp acuteness of his son-in-law that had indeed ever kept him to his colours lord henry would not listen to statistics dietary tables commissioners rides sub-commissioners reports he went far higher than his father far deeper than his brother-in-law 
he represented to the duke that the order of the peasantry was as ancient legal and recognized an order as the order of the nobility that it had distinct rights and privileges though for centuries they had been invaded and violated and permitted to fall into desuetude he impressed upon the duke that the parochial constitution of this country was more important than its political constitution that it was more ancient more universal in its influence and that this parochial constitution had already been shaken to its centre by the new poor law he assured his father that it would never be well for england until this order of the peasantry was restored to its pristine condition not merely in physical comfort for that must vary according to the economical circumstances of the time like that of every class but to its condition in all those moral attributes which makes a recognized rank in a nation and which in a great degree are independent of economics manners customs ceremonies rights and privileges henry thinks said lord everingham that the people are to be fed by dancing around a maypole but will the people be more fed because they do not dance round a maypole urged lord henry obsolete customs said lord everingham and why should dancing round a maypole be more obsolete than holding a chapter of the garter asked lord henry the duke who was a blue ribbon felt this a home thrust i must say said his grace that i for one deeply regret that our popular customs have been permitted to fall so into desuetude the spirit of the age is against such things said lord everingham and what is the spirit of the age asked coningsby the spirit of utility said lord everingham and you think then that ceremony is not useful urged coningsby mildly it depends upon circumstances said lord everingham there are some ceremonies no doubt that are very proper and of course very useful but the best thing we can do for the labouring classes is to provide them with work but what do you mean by the labouring classes everingham asked lord henry lawyers are a labouring class for instance and by the by sufficiently provided with work but would you approve of westminster hall being denuded of all its ceremonies and the long vacation being abolished added coningsby Theresa brings me terrible accounts of the sufferings of the poor about us, said the Duke, shaking his head. Women think everything to be suffering, said Lord Everingham. How do you find them about you, Mr. Lyle, continued the Duke? I have revived the monastic customs at St. Genevieve, said the young man, blushing. There is an alms-giving twice a week. I am sure I wish I could see the labouring classes happy, said the Duke oh pray do not use my dear father that phrase the labouring classes said lord henry what do you think coningsby the other day we had a meeting in this neighbourhood to vote an agricultural petition that was to comprise all classes i went with my father and i was made chairman of the committee to draw up the petition of course i described it as the petition of the nobility clergy gentry yeomanry and peasantry in the county of blank and could you believe it they struck out peasantry as a word no longer used and inserted labourers what can it signify said lord everingham whether a man be called a labourer or a peasant and what can it signify said his brother-in-law whether a man be called mr howard or lord everingham they were the most affectionate family under this roof of beaumanoir and of all members of it lord henry the sweetest tempered and yet it was astonishing what sharp skirmishes every day arose between him and his brother-in-law during that little half-hour that formed so happily the political character of the nation the duke who from experience felt that a guerrilla movement was impending asked his guests whether they would take any more claret and on their signifying their dissent moved an adjournment to the ladies they joined the ladies in the music-room coningsby not experienced in feminine society and who found a little difficulty from want of practice in maintaining conversation though he was desirous of succeeding was delighted with lady everingham who instead of requiring to be amused amused him and suggested so many subjects and glanced at so many topics that there never was that cold awkward pause 
so common with sullen spirits and barren brains lady everingham thoroughly understood the art of conversation which indeed consists of the exercise of two fine qualities you must originate and you must sympathize you must possess at the same time the habit of communicating and the habit of listening the union is rather rare but irresistible lady everingham was not a celebrated beauty but she was something infinitely more delightful a captivating woman there were combined in her qualities not commonly met together great vivacity of mind with great grace of manner her words sparkled and her movements charmed there was indeed in all she said and did that congruity that indicates a complete and harmonious organization it was the same just proportion which characterized her form a shape slight and undulating with grace the most beautifully shaped ear a small soft hand a foot that would have fitted the glass slipper and which by the by she lost no opportunity of displaying and she was right for it was a model then there was music lady theresa sang like a seraph a rich voice a grand style and her sister could support her with grace and sweetness and they did not sing too much the duke took up a review and looked at rigby's last slashing article the country seemed ruined but it appeared that the whigs were still worse off than the tories the assassins had committed suicide this poetical justice is pleasing lord everingham lounging in an easy chair perused with great satisfaction his morning chronicle which contained a cutting reply to mr rigby's article not quite so slashing as the right honourable scribe's manifesto but with some searching mockery that became the subject and the subject monger mr lyle seated himself by the duchess and encouraged by her amenity and speaking in whispers became animated and agreeable occasionally patting the lap-dog coningsby stood by the singers or talked with them when the music had ceased and henry sydney looked over a volume of strutt's sports and pastimes occasionally without taking his eyes off the volume calling the attention of his friends to his discoveries mr lyle rose to depart for he had some miles to return he came forward with some hesitation to hope that coningsby would visit his bloodhounds which lord henry had told him coningsby had expressed a wish to do lady everingham remarked that she had not been at st genevieve since she was a girl and it appeared lady theresa had never visited it lady everingham proposed that they should all ride over on the morrow and she appealed to her husband for his approbation instantly given for though she loved admiration and he apparently was an iceberg they were really devoted to each other then there was a consultation as to their arrangements the duchess would drive over in her pony chair with theresa the duke as usual had affairs that would occupy him the rest were to ride it was a happy suggestion all anticipated pleasure and the evening terminated with the prospect of what lady everingham called an adventure the ladies themselves soon withdrew the gentlemen lingered for a while and the duke took up his candle and bid his guests good-night lord everingham drank a glass of seltzer water nodded and vanished lord henry and his friend sat up talking over the past they were too young to call them old times and yet what a life seemed to have elapsed since they had quitted eton dear old eton their boyish feelings and still latent boyish character developed with their reminiscences do you remember bucknall which bucknall the eldest i saw him the other day at nottingham he is in the rifles do you remember that day at surly hall that paulet had that row with dickinson did you like dickinson hm paulet was a good fellow i tell you who was a good fellow paulet's little cousin what augustus lagrange oh i liked augustus lagrange i wonder where buckhurst is i had a letter from him the other day he has gone with his uncle to paris we shall find him at cambridge in october i suppose you know millbank has gone to oriel has he though i wonder who will have our room at cooksley's cooksley was a good fellow oh capital how well he behaved when there was that row about our going out with the hounds do you remember vere's face it makes me laugh now when i think of it 
I tell you who was a good fellow, Kangaroo Grey. I liked him. I don't know any fellow who sang a better song. By the by, said Coningsby, what sort of fellow is Eustace Lyle? I rather liked his look. Oh, I will tell you all about him, said Lord Henry. He is a great ally of mine, and I think you will like him very much. It is a Roman Catholic family, about the oldest we have in the county, and the wealthiest. You see, Lyle's father was the most violent ultra-Whig, and so were all Eustace's guardians. But the moment he came of age, he announced that he should not mix himself up with either of the parties in the county, and that his tenantry might act exactly as he thought fit. My father thinks, of course, that Lyle is a conservative, and that he only waits the occasion to come forward, but he is quite wrong. I know Lyle well, and he speaks to me without disguise. You see, tis an old Cavalier family, and Lyle has all the opinions and feelings of his race. He will not ally himself with anti-monarchists and democrats and infidels and sectarians. At the same time, why should he support a party who pretend to oppose these, but who never lose an opportunity of insulting his religion, and would deprive him, if possible, of the advantages of the very institutions which his family assisted in establishing? why indeed i am glad to have made his acquaintance said coningsby is he clever i think so said lord henry he is the most shy fellow especially among women that i ever knew but he is very popular in the county he does an amazing deal of good and is one of the best riders we have my father says the very best bold but so very certain he is older than we are my senior by a year he is just of age oh ah twenty-one a year younger than gaston de foix when he won ravenna and four years younger than john of austria when he won lepanto observed coningsby musingly i vote we go to bed old fellow end of chapter three book three chapter four in a valley not far from the margin of a beautiful river raised on a lofty and artificial terrace at the base of a range of wooded heights was a pile of modern buildings in the finest style of christian architecture it was of great extent and richly decorated built of a white and glittering stone it sparkled with its pinnacles in the sunshine as it rose in strong relief against its verdant background the winding valley which was studded but not too closely studded with clumps of old trees formed for a great extent on either side of the mansion a grassy demesne which was called the lower park but it was a region bearing the name of the upper park that was the peculiar and most picturesque feature of this splendid residence the wooded heights that formed the valley were not as they appeared a range of hills their crest was only the abrupt termination of a vast and enclosed tableland abounding in all the qualities of the ancient chase turf and trees a wilderness of underwood and a vast spread of gorse and fern the deer that abounded lived here in a world as savage as themselves trooping down in the evening to the river some of them indeed were ever in sight of those who were in the valley and you might often observe various groups clustered on the green heights above the mansion the effect of which was most inspiriting and graceful sometimes in the twilight a solitary form magnified by the elusive hour might be seen standing on the brink of the steep large and black against the clear sky we have endeavoured slightly to sketch st genevieve as it appeared to our friends from beaumanoir winding into the valley the day after mr lyle had dined with them the valley opened for about half a mile opposite the mansion which gave to the dwellers in it a view over an extensive and richly cultivated country it was through this district that the party from Beaumanoir had pursued their way. The first glance at the building, its striking situation, its beautiful form, its brilliant colour, its great extent, a gathering as it seemed of galleries, halls and chapels, mullioned windows, portals of clustered columns, and groups of airy pinnacles and fretwork spires, called forth a general cry of wonder and of praise. The ride from Beaumanoir had been delightful, the breath of summer in every breeze, the light of summer on every tree, the gay laugh of Lady Everingham rang frequently in the air, 
Often were her sunny eyes directed to Coningsby as she called his attention to some fair object or some pretty effect. She played the hostess of nature and introduced him to all the beauties. Mr. Lyle had recognised them. He cantered forward with greetings on a fat little fawn-coloured pony with a long white mane and a white flowing tail and the wickedest eye in the world. He rode by the side of the Duchess and indicated their gently descending route. They arrived, and the peacocks, who were sunning themselves on the turrets, expanded their plumage to welcome them. "'I can remember the old house,' said the Duchess, as she took Mr. Lyle's arm, "'and I am happy to see the new one. The Duke had prepared me for much beauty, but the reality exceeds his report.' They entered by a short corridor into a large hall. They would have stopped to admire its rich roof, its gallery and screen, but their host suggested that they should refresh themselves after their ride, and they followed him through several apartments into a spacious chamber, its oaken panels covered with a series of interesting pictures representing the siege of St. Genevieve by the Parliament forces in 1643, the various assaults and sallies, and the final discomfiture of the rebels. In all these figured a brave and graceful Sir Eustace Lyle, in cuirass and buff jerkin, with gleaming sword and flowing plume. The sight of these pictures was ever a source of great excitement to Henry Sidney, who always lamented his ill luck in not living in such days, nay, would insist that all others must equally deplore their evil destiny. "'See, Coningsby, this battery on the upper park,' said Lord Henry, "'this did the business.' how it rakes up the valley. Sir Eustace works it himself. Mother, what a pity Beaumanoir was not besieged. It may be, said Coningsby. I always fancy a siege must be so interesting, said Lady Everingham. It must be so exciting. I hope the next siege may be at Beaumanoir instead of St. Genevieve, said Lyle, laughing, as Henry Sidney has such a military predisposition. Duchess, you said the other day that you liked Malvoisie, and here is some. Now broach me a cask of Malvoisie, bring pastry from the dough, said the Duchess. That has been my luncheon. A poetic repast, said Lady Theresa. Their breeds of sheep must have been very inferior in old days, said Lord Everingham, as they made such a noise about their venison. For my part, I consider it a thing as much gone by as tilts and tournaments. "'I am sorry that they have gone by,' said Lady Theresa. "'Everything has gone by that is beautiful,' said Lord Henry. "'Life is much easier,' said Lord Everingham. "'Life easy,' said Lord Henry. "'Life appears to me to be a fierce struggle.' "'Manners are easy,' said Coningsby, "'and life is hard.' "'And I wish to see things exactly the reverse,' said Lord Henry. "'The means and modes of subsistence less difficult the conduct of life more ceremonious. "'Civilization has no time for ceremony,' said Lord Everingham. "'How very sententious you all are,' said his wife. "'I want to see the hall and many other things.' And they all rose. There were, indeed, many other things to see. A long gallery, rich in ancestral portraits, specimens of art and costume from Holbein to Lawrence, courtiers of the Tudors, and cavaliers of the Stuarts, terminating in red-coated squires fresh from the field, and gentlemen buttoned up in black coats, and sitting in library chairs, with their backs to a crimson curtain. Woman, however, is always charming, and the present generation may view their mothers painted by Lawrence as if they were patronesses of Almack's, or their grandmothers by Reynolds, as Robinetta's caressing birds, with as much delight as they gaze on the dewy-eyed matrons of Lely, and the proud bearing of the heroines of Van Dyck. But what interested them more than the gallery, or the rich saloons, or even the baronial hall, was the chapel, in which art had exhausted all its invention, and wealth offered all its resources. The walls and vaulted roofs were entirely painted in encaustic by the first artists of Germany, and representing the principal events of the Second Testament, 
the splendour of the mosaic pavement the richness of the painted windows the sumptuousness of the altar crowned by a masterpiece of carlo dolce and surrounded by a silver rail the tone of rich and solemn light that pervaded all and blended all the various sources of beauty into one absorbing and harmonious whole all combined to produce an effect which stilled them into a silence that lasted for some minutes until the ladies breathed their feelings in an almost inarticulate murmur of reverence and admiration while a tear stole to the eye of the enthusiastic henry sydney leaving the chapel they sauntered through the gardens until arriving at their limit they were met by the prettiest sight in the world a group of little pony chairs each drawn by a little fat fawn-coloured pony like the one that mr lyle had been riding lord henry drove his mother lord everingham lady theresa lady everingham was attended by coningsby their host cantered by the duchess's side and along winding roads of easy ascent leading through beautiful woods and offering charming landscapes they reached in due time the upper park one sees our host a great advantage in his own house said lady everingham he is scarcely the same person i have not observed him once blush he speaks and moves with ease it is a pity that he is not more graceful above all things i like a graceful man the chapel said coningsby was a fine thing very said lady everingham did you observe the picture over the altar the virgin with blue eyes i never observed blue eyes before in such a picture what is your favourite colour for eyes coningsby felt embarrassed he said something rather pointless about admiring everything that was beautiful but every one has a favourite style i want to know yours regular features do you like regular features or is it expression that pleases you expression i think i like expression expression must be always delightful do you dance no i am no great dancer i fear i have few accomplishments i am fond of fencing i don't fence said lady everingham with a smile but i think you are right not to dance it is not in your way you are ambitious i believe she added i was not aware of it everybody is ambitious you see i know something of your character henry has spoken of you to me a great deal long before we met met again i should say for we are old friends remember do you know your career much interests me i like ambitious men there is something fascinating in the first idea that your career interests a charming woman coningsby felt that he was perhaps driving a madame de longueville a woman who likes ambitious men must be no ordinary character clearly a sort of heroine at this moment they reached the upper park and the novel landscape changed the current of their remarks far as the eye could reach there spread before them a savage sylvan scene it wanted perhaps undulation of surface but that deficiency was greatly compensated for by the multitude and prodigious size of the trees they were the largest indeed that could well be met with in england and there is no part of Europe where the timber is so huge. The broad, interminable glades, the vast avenues, the quantity of deer browsing or bounding in all directions, the thickets of yellow gorse and green fern, and the breeze that even in the stillness of summer was ever playing over this tableland, all produced an animated and renovating scene. It was like suddenly visiting another country, living among other manners, and breathing another air. They stopped for a few minutes at a pavilion built for the purposes of the chase, and then returned, all gratified by this visit, to what appeared to be the higher regions of the earth. As they approached the brow of the hill that hung over St. Genevieve, they heard the great bell sound. "'What is that?' asked the Duchess. "'It is alms-giving day,' replied Mr. Lyle, looking a little embarrassed, and for the first time blushing. "'The people of the parishes with which I am connected come to St. Genevieve twice a week at this hour.' "'And what is your system?' inquired Lord Everingham, who had stopped, interested by the scene. "'What check have you?' 
the rectors of the different parishes grant certificates to those who in their belief merit bounty according to the rules which i have established they are again visited by my almoner who countersigns the certificate and then they present it at the postern gate the certificate explains the nature of their necessities and my steward acts on his discretion mamma i see them exclaimed lady theresa perhaps your grace may think that they might be relieved without all this ceremony said mr lyle extremely confused but i agree with henry and mr coningsby that ceremony is not as too commonly supposed an idle form i wish the people constantly and visibly to comprehend that property is their protector and their friend my reason is with you mr lyle said the duchess as well as my heart they came along the valley a procession of nature whose groups an artist might have studied the old man who loved the pilgrimage too much to avail himself of the privilege of a substitute according to his grey hairs came in person with his grandchild and his staff there also came the widow with her child at the breast and others clinging to her form some sorrowful faces and some pale many a serious one and now and then a frolic glance many a dame in her red cloak and many a maiden with her light basket curly-headed urchins with demure looks and sometimes a stalwart form baffled for a time of the labour which he desired but not a heart that did not bless the bell that sounded from the towers of st genevieve chapter four